And now, a moment from the Occulture Archives. Episode 55, P.D. Newman in Alchemically Stoned. There's this association of the Knights Templar being in possession of the Holy Grail. And, you know, there's been plenty of books written around this, uh, the Templar Revelation, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, etc., well, the only thing they confessed to being in possession of was a severed head. So how do you how do you rectify a grail with a head? Well, it's in the name itself. As Von Hammer, who was really an anti-Templar character, he argued that Baphomet was a combination of two Greek words, Baphe Matisse, which means the baptism of wisdom. And I, I think that's probably the best interpretation of what's going on, mainly because, uh, you know, the other interpretations are uh, that Baphomet is a, an amalgamation of different words like Sophia and Muhammad, which is possible given the Gnostic inclinations and the fact that the Templars may have had some kind of connection with the assassins outside of them being diametrical opposites against one another. But the Baphometis thing really stuck with me because I had just recently read in the Corpus Hermeticum where it talks about how deity sent down a cup of mind, a cup of wisdom to man so that man might baptize, baptize himself in this libation. So you're automatically kind of faced with, well, it's a cup, but they're supposed to baptize themselves with it. Well, you drink from cups. So, you know, whether they're drinking from it or pouring it over their head, there's still this association with this cup. And uh, later, when I actually went through the Masonic degrees and decided to go through what's called the Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite, as well as in the York Rite, there are two rituals, one in each, that pertain to the Templars. And the culmination of these rituals is the drinking of wine from an actual human skull, uh, from the, the cap of the skull that's, you know, uh, inverted, filled with wine, and, and you drink it. And, you know, sitting there at the altar and with the candles flickering, you know, looking at the skull cup and during my initiation, I was immediately struck with the resolution that... Here I am looking at both a grail, a cup, and a severed head, and not to mention the association of drinking a libation with this idea of baptism, baptism of wisdom, a cup of mind, as they said in the Hermetic text. Yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where we keep the high times rolling. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And it is a good time to be here because Chris Bennett is in the house. Chris has been researching the historical role of cannabis in magic and religion for over a quarter century. He's written three previous books, Green Gold, The Tree of Life, Marijuana and Magic and Religion, Sex, Drugs, Violence, and the Bible, and Cannabis and the Soma Solution. But he's here because today, Friday, April 20th, he's just released his most comprehensive book yet. It's called Liber 420, Cannabis, Magical Herbs, and the Occult. And it is literally anything and everything you'd want to know about the occulted use of cannabis in religion, mystery traditions, magical rituals, alchemy, and much more. It's damn near 800 pages long, so we're going to talk a bit about that. Chris joined me via cell phone, so the audio is good, but not great. And we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. And honestly... This one's pretty chill and relaxed, as one might expect, given the content. So do yourself a favor and make like Chong and fire this one up and take a hit 
from this audio bong. Enjoy. Chris Bennett, thanks for being here, man. That's my pleasure. Oh, no, no, no. The pleasure's all mine, believe me. So I want to start with the term language of the birds. This was a term popularized by the Sufis and adopted later by European alchemists. And it's an esoteric language of symbolism and metaphor used to hide secrets from the profane. For example, and I'm going to quote your book now, the Sufi poet Attar, he used the parrot as a symbol of hashish, likely because of its gift of words or poetic inspiration associated with its use. So I only begin here because not only have you written this massive tome called Libra 420, which is all about the occulted history of cannabis, but you also have a parrot, which I've heard That's in right. the background. Yeah, I've heard in the background of some other podcasts you've done, and I found it a bit curious. You know, it's not every day you meet someone with a parrot, right? But it wasn't until I read this tidbit in your book that it all made sense to me. You know, I have a great painting of from the 18th century, and it's called Thacker's Prepare Bomb. And it has a group of packers, and they're stripping uh, cannabis off of a uh, stock and grinding it with mortars and pestles and uh, preparing it into bomb through a filter. And they, um, a lot of them have parrots on their shoulders and stuff like that. So there must be uh, some sort of connection there, you know, even into that time. That's like the 18th century. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, just, <laughs> I don't think I got my parrot specifically because of uh, that, although I, I was aware of it. I, I, I had a parrot when I was a kid, and I always liked birds. There, he's kind of making some noise right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he'll be uh, he'll probably make a few cameos throughout this, I'm sure. And I should tell you, man, I'm like sure. I've I've only met one other guy with a parrot. He was uh, a neighbor of mine for several years, and he definitely he definitely liked to get high. We actually we smoked a few times <laughs> together, but he never struck me as someone who had any knowledge of the language of the birds, you know. But I found it curious because he would take his parrot on walks around the neighborhood. It just like sit on his shoulder as he walked up and down the block. Do you do the same thing? I live in a city, uh, so it's kind of busy. So it's just I live like right, right, right in a busy part of town, so not really ideal for it. But uh, I have done that before. I used to go out with them, but I, I, you know, what I find is too many people want to talk to me about my parrot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, enough about parrots. Let's get into Libra 420. I mean, holy shit, Chris. This is, I called it a massive tome. It's its that if there ever was one. It's damn near 800 pages long. And I'd like to begin with the number and the date 420. Why is this traditionally associated with the use of cannabis? You know, that just kind of came about on its own accord. There's a number of uh, claims about the origins of how April 20th became the big uh, cannabis day and 420 became associated some uh, say it was the time a group of California high school kids would meet to puff up after school. Some have claimed it was like some sort of police code for uh, cannabis or something like that. You know, there's, there's all these different stories. I like to think it just kind of came up from the collective unconscious. There's some really wild synchronistic connections, you know. H.P. Lovecraft, he wrote this whole story about some plant that made you kind of uh, feel a shift in time. And, and in that story, the guy looks at his watch and it's 420, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> yeah. uh, The Walls of Erenix, I think it's called, that story. And, uh, you know, there's this whole uh, uh, ritual I use in the introduction to Lieber 420 about in 1918 when uh, Alistair Crowley and a couple of his uh, associates, uh, one of them, Charles Stansfield Jones, who I found out while writing this book, actually lived just a couple of doors down from the house I grew up here in North Vancouver in uh, Deep Cove, which is kind of uncanny. And uh, they had this whole uh, you know ritual they did with cannabis that was on uh, April 20th, 100 years ago, you know? So just one of those kind of weird synchronistic connections. And uh I think cannabis really does kind of weave like that in and out of history and uh, connectivity between times and places. You know, it's, it's kind of magical in that way. It definitely is. And, you know, your book does tell us that cannabis was used in magical and, uh, I guess, general occult practices during the Middle Ages and up to now. But how far back does the use of cannabis and other psychoactive substances actually go? I mean, I would think it'd go back as far yeah, as... Yeah, you, you know, the, uh, oh, you know, I've written a lot about the age, agent use of cannabis in some of my other books, like uh, Cannabis in the Soma Solution and Sex, Drugs, Violence in the Bible. And Carl Sagan speculated that Cannabis was actually, you know, uh, uh, humanity's oldest agricultural crop. 
And he based this on the pygmies who claimed they had been using cannabis since the dawn of time. Now, the pygmies came into cannabis probably later, we, but this you know, has to do with their conception of time. And uh, in Sagan's view, because they were hunter-gatherers and then they first made the transition into agriculture by growing cannabis, that this may have been the case for agent man as well. And certainly, we have really old archaeological evidence of cannabis, you know, fiber-wise in, the, in evidence of rope and cloth. Some uh, people have placed it back as far as uh, 25,000 years based on plant fiber, uh, fossilized plant fiber impressions and uh, tools used for the, the recording of uh, the fibers off of the stock. And uh, for smoke, you know, inhaled cannabis, the oldest archaeological evidence we have is 5,500 years. And this is from the Ukraine region. And uh, this was uh, polypod bowls where cannabis had burnt inside of a these bowls inside a cave that would have held the fumes in. So that's pretty old. And then um, by 4,000 years ago, in the uh, Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex, which is in Afghanistan, uh, there was evidence found of three temples, these are very large temples about the size of a football field. Uh, and, and half of some of these sites was dedicated to the preparation of a sacred beverage, which the archaeologist Victor Sarianati claims was the Persian Haoma. The, the counterpart of the Indian Soma. And, you know, they were using cannabis and ephedra there to prepare a, a sacred beverage. And by this time, you know, that's like 4,000 years ago, it's already taking place. So obviously this use had been going on for quite some time prior to the conception of these temples, one would think. So very, very old, you know, the, the, the term cannabis itself, the root of that term, tana, is proto-Indo-European. So it's from a yet language before the Indo-European language, which is the mother language of French, German, Sanskrit, English, you know, other languages. And so that's even before those languages split off from their mother language, the Indo-European. It was in Proto-Indo-European, uh, according to etymologists. So that is an indication of how old it is and, and how far back our relationship goes with it. Definitely, yeah. And I'm wondering, is cannabis or any other psychoactive substance, like, would you think that this is really, would you say that that's where the first religious or spiritual thoughts came from, from using these kind of substances? Yeah, that's my, you know, I think that shamanism is what gave birth to religion. And I think that's the, the real powerful implication of, of this plant in our own period of time, you know, when we see all these fundamental religions uh, gearing up to go to world war as we speak. You know, as we speak, this is a real, the real fundamental paradigm shift. I think that, 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 that this research about cannabis in the inception of religion offers humanity is that these religions were founded by shamans who used psychoactive plants. And that's something that these fundamental religions have always rallied against since their inception. You know, uh, in, the, in the example of Christianity, we can see it with the inception of the Dark Ages, when all uh, pagan cults were suppressed, along with Gnostic Christians who used these substances. The Dark Ages, with the witches burnt as heretics, the, the, the rape of the New World and uh, desecration of cultures that recognized the power of peyote and psilocybin mushrooms. So, you know, this is the pivotal stuff, you know, and throughout the Bible, because what it reveals is the prophets of the Bible were the counterparts of these witch doctors and shamans and figures like that, 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 the, that these religions were out to suppress. So that's a powerful piece of information that I think really needs to be brought out and, and discussed out in the open, you know? And that's what I've been working at for about a quarter century is trying to get this information <laughs> yeah. into the mainstream. I'm starting to see it a bit now, you know, with this, uh, my material about Jesus and cannabis is continually uh, getting turned into clickbait as, as a meme, you know, out there. So mm -hmm. it's starting to reach out. And then people that dig deeper, there's, you know, see that there's some really solid research behind these ideas. Definitely, yeah. And I don't think of cannabis as something that's actually, I guess, psychedelically potent, but in the right dosage and mindset, it can be, right? Absolutely. You know, even even smoke cannabis, you know, for novice users, it can be quite powerful. Uh, people have psychotic breaks and stuff like that, you know, uh, under the influence, not really being familiar with it. But ingested cannabis can be very powerful, you know. And a lot of times, you know, in, in these agent cultures, say like Zoroastrianism, for instance, uh, where they use these cannabis-infused wines, you know, these people weren't using cannabis regularly. This was like you were selected out of the group and you were given like six cups of this cannabis-infused wine, and it knocked you out for a couple of days. And when you came to, 
They wanted to know where you'd been, you know, as your body laid there comatose, you know, and people mm-hmm. had visions and stuff and dreams under it. And they considered this as evidence that the, the soul that could leave the body, you know. So these are very potent infusions. So there's like, you know, all sorts of elements that come into play with this. In the case of Moses, you know, maybe not so potent as the Zoroastrian accounts. Uh, and this is based on the research of uh, Sula Bennett, who uh, first uh, uh, started writing about this Hebrew term, cannabosum in 1936 and wrote about it for some decades after that this term was a reference to cannabis that had mistranslated when the bible was first translated into greek and these mistranslations followed into the latin and calamus came to be uh, considered what is thought even uh, biblical scholars acknowledge there's a lot of controversy about what this term cannabosa means Sula Bennett pointed to the linguistic similarities to uh, our modern term cannabis and then uh, Mishnah terms for cannabis, cannabis. And my view is, is that, uh, you know, this cannabis in the Old Testament came in on trade routes. So it came in with the, you know, the regular name that it had, canna, and this got adopted into the Hebrew lexicon and then eventually became cannabis. But in Exodus 30, 23, God, who first appears into Moses from in flames of fire from within a burning bush, God commands Moses to make a holy anointing oil with about nine pounds of this cannabis mixed in with myrrh and cinnamon and cassia into about a gallon and a half of olive oil. And whenever Moses is to speak to the Lord, he's going to go into what is called the tent of the meeting, and he's to cover himself in this oil, THC, fatty soluble, this is quite a potent formula. And he would also take some of this oil and he would put it on the altar of incense and burn it, and he would speak to the Lord in the pillar of smoke over the altar of incense. And that's where you'd see the angel of the Lord. And he wouldn't be speaking to the Lord unless there was smoke coming out of the tent of the meeting. That's what it describes in the situation in Exodus. You know what I mean? Yeah, and definitely. so when you throw cannabis into that tent with Moses, he's speaking to a discriminated entity that said to go kill all the Canaanites and take over their land and had all these crazy commandments, some of them okay, or... Was Moses, you know, like going in there as a shaman and ingesting a psychoactive plant in the same spirit as a shaman and considering the effects that came over him, the spirit possessing him or uh, the voices that he heard in his head in response to the questions that he put out uh, as coming from from the cloud, you know, from within the smoke of, uh, of the pillar of smoke. We see the same sort of situation in later magic, you know, the Picatrix which is one of the uh, founding documents of the Western magical tradition. Originally, uh, the, the, the Gayat al-Hakim, when it was an Islamic document written in the 9th and 10th century, it has a recipe for uh, a cannabis incense fumigation to invoke the uh, messenger of the moon that involved about a pound and a half of ha- uh, hashish, cannabis resin, mixed with sag blood and other ingredients, and, then that, and that as well. They're speaking it to the to the uh, the deity in the smoke itself. You know what I mean? And so we're talking about a, a psychoactive effect uh, that could produce parapolio. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, where you can start seeing shapes and images in other things, maybe in the uh, bark of a tree, you see a face or something like that. Same sort of thing applies to the smoke and the movement of the smoke, and you start to start seeing things under the influence and uh, desire to see them and. Uh, uh, this is a major part of, of magic, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a few minutes ago, you mentioned the, the cannabis-infused wine, and I had a question about that, because I know yep. you've covered you've covered Soma at length in some previous books, and it's popped up on the show here a couple times in conversation, and it's usually speculated to be a drink that was infused with magic mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. well, I have a chapter yeah. uh, destroying Watson's uh, research in his book, uh, Soma in my book, Cannabis and the Soma Solution. And there's just, uh, in my opinion, there's zero evidence. I think that, you know, many plants came to be used in both Soma and Haoma. And even the, uh, uh, you know, the texts indicate that as well. Mushrooms, however, I don't see any evidence for it. And I've been through a lot of material on this. And if anybody's interested, you can go find my book, Cannabis and the Soma Solution on Google Books. And you just put Wasson in there. And you can read my chapter on that for free on there and see for yourself. In fact, that, that, that is something that I ran up against, against again and again when I was researching my book on cannabis and the Soma Solution. And Professor Scott Littleton, uh, he passed away a, a few years ago. He was a professor of Indo-European studies. When I first approached him about it, he's like, oh, no, no. Cannabis is the amnium muscari. And I'm like, just, I'm like, just read this. 
And so he read it, and he ended up writing the back cover of my book. <laughs> you know, so uh, there's plenty of arguments against the whole mushroom theory. That is fair. Does that have any relation then to the famed elixir of immortality in alchemy? Well, th there's like this whole situation of quintessences in arcanums, in alchemy, in spigeric alchemy. That's the branch of alchemy that works with plants. And there's numerous recipes for cannabis in arcanums and quintessences, which were basically alcoholic tinctures. They would uh, mm -hmm. refine wine to a, to a clear alcoholic solution and infuse plants. And the one, uh, this, uh, this alcoholic preparation was thought of as a chemical heaven. And when you put the plants in and took out their properties, this was thought to be like the soul of the plant, the essence of the plant. That's the name quintessence. And cannabis appears in arcanum and quintessences to such well-known figures as Paracelsus, Jerome Cardano, the Lullian alchemical corpus, uh, directly, by name. You know, there's Latin references to it, and I reprint a number of recipes that I had translated out of Latin in Libra 420. So, yeah, the elixir of immortality is the same sort of thing, part of that, and cannabis is definitely part of that tradition. Now, these elixirs could also be made from other substances. And, you know, in uh, uh, Paracelsus' case, uh, he has the famous tincture laudanum, which was an opium preparation as well. And it's thought that Paracelsus' version of the Philosopher's Stone was a solid form of laudanum opium pellets. And uh, that he kept a few grains of these in the, in the pummel of his sword. He's always holding on to, and it says Azoth on his sword in a lot of uh, depictions. And that's a reference to the Philosopher's Stone that he kept in there. But different alchemists used different plants to get their quintessences and arcanum. Some of them preferred other plants, and cannabis is amongst those plants that was used. So there is some evidence that cannabis was prepared into a version of the Philosopher's Stone, and it was definitely uh, used in, in quintessences and arcanum. So these traditions, it seems, migrated from the East. You talk about this in your book, and you mentioned Crowley earlier. So he traveled through India, I wrote an essay called The Psychology of Hashish, and in that essay he said that, that Indian yogis had used this to achieve oneness with the universe, and that's what I, I, think, know, I think it's... You know, himself, yeah. he had his first experience of samadhi under the influence of cannabis, and this was something that he, he himself struggled with. This is in his private diary, because he thought that people would reject it based on it being induced by a drug, and this has, has a lot to do with how, why Crowley chose to kind of put a veil over some of his cannabis references in his writings. I actually had a really big chapter on Crowley that I had to pull from Libra 420 for space, you know. One of the things, like when I, when I started to write Libra 420 initially, I'd approach the publisher with like maybe a 300-page book, and I thought it'd be, you know, like enough material on the occult right up until like the 1950s or so in that amount of work. And I thought the bulk of it would be 19th century stuff, Crowley and people like that, because there's just so much information on that. I, I thought maybe I'd be able to get a, a chapter or two out of medieval and Renaissance. But as I began to delve into this period, because nothing's been written about it, you know, there's like uh, uh, much of the material I have about magical grimoires uh, and these cannabis references and uh, these alchemical references. And this isn't like any matter of interpretation on my part. This is what it says in these texts. It refers to cannabis has not been discussed or written about in all the histories of cannabis I've read, and I've read you know, probably most of what's out there. So I didn't realize it was going to be so much stuff for the medieval and renaissance period, so I had to you know, limit the, the 19th century stuff to a single chapter, had to pull my Crowley chapter, and I'm going to discuss that and publish the Crowley chapter in a book in, in the next couple of years. You mentioned the medieval period, and you said in the book, I want to quote you, the meeting of medieval Europe with the Islamic world was pivotal in the introduction or reintroduction of things like alchemy, magic, science, and medicine into the Western world. So obviously, you know, like we mentioned Crowley goes to India, but those traditions that he partook in are a lot older than 
we would probably think, right? And they would have migrated oh, yeah. from the east to the west. And, you know, Chris, I've always had an interest in these old mystical Persian and Arabic religions. I love reading about Zoroastrianism and the Magi, the Sufis and the Hashishins, or the Assassins, I guess is probably an, an easier way to pronounce their name. Those groups fascinate me. And coincidentally, they were all getting pretty high on cannabis. So I guess, you know, starting with maybe Zoroastrianism, we do see mentions of cannabis in the Avesta, right? Yeah, yeah, in the Avesta, and then a lot of later writings, too. You know, there's like the, the tale of Ardu uh, Virat, who had his otherworldly journey to heaven and hell, drinking cannabis-infused wine, and Bishtasba. And these are like, you know, these, these, these texts, and this goes right up into the 5th century AD. These texts use the, the either Pallavi term for cannabis, manga, or the uh, earlier Zoroastrian term, the, the Vedica, the, the Avestan language, banga. You know, so, you know, it's clearly identified as cannabis. And uh, in Vishtaspa's case, he saw the end of the world. This led to the concepts uh, that ca- they, they used in uh, Revelation. Vishtaspa's oracle was prohibited literature in the ancient world, world the oracle of High Saspius. And uh, this w- predicted the downfall of Rome, so it got banned. <laughs> uh, um, but it was all uh, produced by uh, a cannabis-infused journey. Likewise, with the concepts of heaven and hell, as we know them, from uh, Ardu Virak's uh, cannabis-infused journey. The, the uh, Hashishins, they originated in the Persian region, you know what I mean? So right up into the early Islamic period, well, the Zoroastrians were still using cannabis-infused wines. And then uh, in basically what is like a death and rebirth kind of initiation, where the person was thought to have died and gone to the other world and returned, and then we see these uh, claims of initiation beginning around, you know, 11th, 12th century uh, against the uh, Hashishin that they were using them in these, you know, uh, uh, kind of an Islamic version of the death and rebirth initiation where the uh, devotee was taken to paradise and given all the horries of the afterworld. Yeah, and just so people know who we're talking about, the Hashishins, like I said, they're also known as the Assassins, but what was their role in the history of Hashish? Because it seems like, obviously, the names are very similar. Yeah, well, there's a lot of debate about that. Some people dispute the etymology, uh, and that even that the uh, Hashashians, which were a, a branch of the Ishmaeli Islamics, used cannabis. But I, I, I've been over a lot of material on this. I'm of the view that they were clearly using it because they were deeply influenced by Zoroastrian influences. And uh, they're using it, you know, the descriptions indicate they're using it in the same way. Some of the arguments, well, they were so holy, but that doesn't take away from the uh, use of uh, psychoactive substances. That's just like a modern prejudice that somehow somebody using something like cannabis couldn't be holy because they're using drugs, you know. Uh, that's not the way that this would have been perceived at that time. And then we also have, as I show in Libra 420, the original old man of the, uh, old man of the mountain, uh, the leader of the, the Hashishin, Sanai Sabah, his school chum, Omar Khayyam. He was writing about cannabis-infused wines in some of his poems. So, you know, just by proxy alone, we have evidence that they would have been familiar with it and had access to it. You know, uh, in Helm and Harmeline by uh, Flattery and Schwartz, they make the bold claim that uh, there was not any sort of intoxicating use of cannabis until the medieval time. But that's just not countered by uh, the archaeological finds of cannabis in the ancient world. Uh, where it was clearly used in things like Haoma and Scythian finds and things like that. Yeah, and just so people know this too, like there's some speculation that the tribe Muhammad came from is the same Hashashin tribe, right? Yeah, the, the name of the tribe is Hashim. There's actually uh, in the Dabistan, this is this 17th century uh, collection of folklore, history, and stuff like that that was put together in India. But, you know, the, the tales in it were much older. This is just what they put together when they put this one volume together. There's this whole story of uh, Muhammad, who was a traveling person, traveling salesman on the, on the trade routes and stuff like that, is in India, and he comes into contact with some sadhus who are preparing bong and have nothing to strain it through. And in the tale, uh, Muhammad actually removes his turban, and they pour the bong through that, turning the turban green. And they say that is why the green is the color of Muhammad's tribe, the Hashim. And uh, other people have speculated that Muhammad's night flight to Mecca is of the same cloth as Ardu Virak, who I was discussing earlier. And that this is just another Islamic counterpart 
of these psychoactive journeys under the influence of cannabis infusions with Muhammad taking a night flight in this. And they refer to some uh, passage in, I, I believe, the Quran where he drinks some water right before it. Well, you know, the water was obviously more than water in this case. This is a similar to some of the passages that are discussed in, uh, in the Zoroastrian literature. Yeah, and we were talking about wine and soma, and I wanted to read something here and then ask you a question. This is a quote from your book. As we shall see, the elements of history and myth around the plant filtered into Europe via the occult books like the Picatrix and the alchemical works of Sufis and Ismailian figures, and through the well-known Islamic influence on Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and other secret societies, and most interestingly, in the myths of the origins of the Holy Grail. So I'm curious... What is the Holy Grail to you? You know, we've heard a lot of uh, speculation that it's an yeah. actual cup that, that Soma went into, but there's also this sort of like metaphorical meaning to it, you know? I think there's the origins of the Grail, then there's all this mythology and symbolism that got attached to it after the origins. And in the origins, um, a number of scholars have pointed to the, the cup that, that, that Soma was originally drunk from was called the Graha, which has got some similarity to the Grail. And it was a sacred golden cup. And then we have later Persian accounts of the cup of uh, Jamshid, which was a golden goblet that you can see visions in. You know what I mean? And this is at the same time that uh, other Zoroastrian accounts were referring to drinking the cannabis infusions from golden goblet. And so my view is that this is the indication, uh, and not just my view, other people have suggested it long before I did, uh, that there's an indication that there's a connection between Soma and the Grail. And there's a lot of other, like, Persian symbolism and mythology that's in the wider Grail mythos. So there's parallels, really strong parallels. And there's also uh, claims of Scythian connections. Actually, Professor Scott Littleton, who wrote the back uh, cover for my Soma book, he has a book from Scythia to Camelot. And he says that these golden, the golden cups of the Scythians were... Uh, I guess this is where the origins of the Grail myth came from, and the Scythians were over in Europe and in England and Scotland and other places like that and had outposts there, and that this had uh, filtered into the mythology and became part of the European mythology of the Grail myth. And he says any sort of correlation to what's going on in the Mideast is true too, not, need not be true too, because they both would have stemmed from the earlier uh, tradition. And interestingly enough, uh, one of the things uh, that, that occurred archaeologically after uh, Professor Littleton passed away, and this was something I expressed to him before he passed away, as I said, it's more than those cups. It's what they were drinking in those cups, because uh, besides burning uh, cannabis and inhaling its fumes in enclosed tents, the Scythians were also known to drink cannabis preparations, cannabis and these wines and things. And since uh, Littleton has passed away, there has been an archaeological discovery reported in National Geographic. You can find out about it. Scythian gold cups and the residues uh, uh, taken from these gold cups produced evidence of opium and cannabis. And these are the same plants that were, you know, used in the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex. Although ephedra occurs there as well, but I'm not clear on whether these cups were even tested for a feather, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's residues of that as well. And the Russian archaeologists who have been uh, working on this, uh, Anton uh, Gas, he says that these were cups were used for drinking Naoma, which is the Persian counterpart of Soma. I noticed in some of the sources that you cited uh, throughout the book that they referred to the use of hashish as an alchemical sacrament, and I find that language curious It's also worth noting that cannabis and other herbs were used, and I'm quoting you now here, that they were used in various tincture preparations of alchemy, which we talked about, that begin to appear in alchemical texts in the Mideast as early as 1300 and occur later in a number of alchemical and medical treatises in Europe. And I was just wondering, what were some of those treatises? Is there anything out there that's widely available that people would have heard of? Well, not so much that you would have heard of, but yeah, no, in, the, in that regard, in regards to European, well, in regards to Islamic sources, you know, the works of Abba Siena uh, have numbers of uh, cannabis recipes in them. Uh, Geber as well makes reference to cannabis. Uh, these are famous alchemical Islamic figures. And going back even further to Zosimos, 
in the fourth century, kind of a pivotal figure in early alchemy, he refers to uh, magicians infusing uh, cannabis into wines and beers, as well as other uh, narcotic substances. And then in later European, as I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, uh, arcanums, which are quintessences, basically, uh, an arcanum of paracelsis. And if you search, uh, anybody Google searches paracelsis cannabis, they'll find an article online about that, as well as if you search uh, uh, Avicenna cannabis, you'll find an article online about that. And Zosimos cannabis, you'll find an article online about that. And it will have the translated passages to these preparations. So there, right there, there's a few examples right there that you can uh, verify in a moment. Yeah, and we were talking about the Grail just a couple minutes ago. And you can't talk about Grail myths without mentioning the Knights Templar. They're probably the group most associated with the idea of the Grail. I'm, I'm curious where their association with those sorts of myths and stories actually began. Well, uh, well, from von Etzbach, uh, you know, writing in the, at the time of the Templars, incorporates them into the uh, uh, the mythology. So right from the get go of, of of the whole Grail mythology, th- there's references to the Templars in relation to that. In regards to cannabis, you know, like I speculated, you know, that they may have because we know that they were involved quite at times, you know, more peaceful than others with the Hashishin, either at war at them or at times of truce, uh, more kind of a trade relationship, that type of thing. So I speculated about it, and some authors have made claims that, about that. And when I was researching Libra 420, one of the things I was really trying to uh, follow up on were these various claims that occurred in a number of books about aloe vera and also uh, uh, in a book about uh, medieval medicine and heresy by a Doc Fioso, I believe his name is, an Italian professor. There's claims that there was the, the Templars had a cannabis infused wine also using aloe called the elixir of Jerusalem and I was like well these claims are pretty interesting you know and that seemed uh, like something worth following up but the the furthest I could trace this back to was a book written in the 1990s about aloe vera and they don't offer any source document documentation or anything like that so it was kind of a dead end. I could, you know, nobody, even the, the, the professor in his book on medieval, uh, he may have just got the idea from the aloe book or something like that. He doesn't give any sort of source. But however, when I continued to dig deeper back into time period documents and things, I found that cannabis was a, on a list of these items at two of the Templar locations rated. And they don't describe the form of the cannabis. It's just described as cannabis and weights put to it. And it's a considerable amount of cannabis. And, you know, when they talk about other things like cloth, they just give a more full description of what it is. So it just seems like it was some sort of raw form of cannabis. And they also had a, an agreement with uh, Saracens to grow cannabis for them in Spain, along with saffron and other herbs. And the Saracens were not particularly known for growing fiber hemp. These are people, you know, a culture that uses the resin varieties of cannabis. So uh, that's very intriguing in light of this. As well, a pope that was friendly with the Templars during the time of the Templars, before they fell out of this paper with the Catholic Church, uh, Pope Leo, I forget what number, he wrote a medical treatise influenced by Islamic medicine, and it included a recipe for a cannabis-infused wine, these medically. And the portfolio of Villar de Honecourt, a mason who was in the Holy Land at the time of the Templars and who returned to Europe with a Masonic logbook, the only full page of written text in this manuscript, which is full of beautiful illustrations, is a recipe for a cannabis infused wine. So, Chris, do you think that cannabis played any role in the mass arrest and uh, like eventual extermination of the nice Templars? This is a theory, and it's going to sound kind of preposterous to lay out in, you know, a few words, you know, and uh, people may find this completely doubtful. But uh, my view is the the Templars picked up some sort of Gnostic heresy. And that idea is old, that the the, the Templars had picked up some sort of uh, Gnostic heresy that had survived down into that time period in the Islamic world goes back centuries. That's not my, uh, you know, I didn't come up with that. Uh, people have been suggesting this for a long time. And, you know, they were accused of heresy, right? And mocking the cross, and mocking the sacraments and stuff like that. And, you know, and I, in, in Libra 420 and elsewhere, I, I, I provide a lot of evidence that the Gnostics were also partaking of these same sorts of sacraments. And these, this heresy, you know, from the descriptions of the Ishmaeli 
uh, or Hashishin, and uh, from earlier Zoroastrian accounts or of a initiation that produced a death-like state. And then the person would come back and say, oh, I saw this. In accounts of these things, people that saw the person under the influence of it thought they had died too. They were so still and appeared dead for all purposes. And it's not widely known, but cannabis can actually throw you into a powerful death-like uh, stupor. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the first anesthetics was a cannabis-infused wine in China. They performed complicated operations, on, uh, you know, knocking people out with cannabis. And there's knowledge of this in the ancient world. And, you know, like uh, in the 19th century, there's accounts of uh, fakirs in India, you know, getting buried for a week and then dug up and coming back to life. And uh, uh, Dr. James Braid of Edinburgh uh, wrote a book, uh, Trance in Human Hibernation, and suggested that amongst the techniques in this uh, could be a cannabis infusion. It's going to throw you into a cataleptic state where your body stiffens up like it's got rigor mortis. That's a good segue into something I wanted to mention, you know, the story of Jesus, because you do write about well, that's it. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's okay. Right. I guess we're on the same page, so go ahead. Well, the Templars were accused of mocking the cross, even pissing on the cross, amongst the accusations. And the cross, the, the flagpost of the, the Catholic Church, without the cross and Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection, all the whole thing's out the window. The whole forgiveness of sin is based on Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And uh, in, in the 1960s, uh, Professor Hugh Schoenfield wrote a book, The Passover Plot, and he suggested in that book that Jesus, uh, when he was given the sponge on the cross, and he, t- he takes the the wine from the sponge and says, it is done and passes away, was given some sort of a potion that threw him into a death-like stupor. So it appeared that he died on the cross and that his secret servant, Nicodemus, and his servant, they're described in the Bible, and they even use the term, the secret servant, Nicodemus, go to the tomb with aloes, uh, rock bomb and stuff like that, and they bring him to. And, you know, those techniques are not part of the Jewish burial system. You know, you don't go and place bombs and stuff on the dead body. It's not in that, you know. So they're doing something else. And it's the same sort of way that they would wake up these factors. The uh, servants would come and start rubbing lotions on their muscles and, stretch, you know, giving them a massage. And slowly the guy would kind of come about. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, Schofield also is the one that came up with the Atash cipher that showed that uh, the term Baphomet was a cipher for uh, the Gnostic goddess Sophia. And it had meant actually the baptism of Sophia. This is something that also Joseph von Hammer Pergstall suggested. He, he suggested that uh, the term baffle may actually meant uh, baptism of Metis. And Metis was a uh, name of Sophia, according to uh, von Hammer Pergstall in his famous book about the Templars, uh, Asterior and Baphometum uh, Repilatum. So, you know, it, it's interesting. So, uh, that's my kind of, you know, what I go with in, in Labor 420 on that, is that this is the basis for the Temple of Heresy. But I'm pretty clear that this is, you know, based on some bits of evidence, but it's big speculation. What is not speculation are these references in alchemy and magical grimoires. And this is a much more clear and uh, identifiable route of cannabis into Europe. Okay, so you're mentioning the these these grimoires, and that's a good, I think, transition out of that Templar stuff and into what I guess you dropped this earlier, the Gayat Al Hakim. Some listeners may know that by another name, which we mentioned earlier as well. But what is that text? This is an uh, Islamic grimoire that was written in the ninth, tenth, eleventh century, depending on who you uh, ask. That was translated in the thirteenth century under uh, King Alfonso the tenth in Spain into Latin and uh, became the Picatrix. And it's kind of the foundational document uh, of Western magic and has to do with like, you know, planetary associations with plants and other rituals and all these types of things, a a form of uh, astrological magic, you know, that became very popular in Europe after this. And it has, besides uh, the use of body parts and other grim re- uh, ingredients, it has numbers of recipes that contain things like cannabis, opium, mandrake, various nightshades, that type of stuff. So uh, clearly uh, the, the narcotic plants and uh, psychoactive plants were a part of the magical tradition from the get-go. Yeah, you mentioned the Picatrix is comprised of... A bunch of different things. It's essentially four books with uh, detailed instructions in the arts of astrology, talismanic magic, 
contacting the astral realm. Put together by the works of a hundred pages or something mm-hmm. like that, you know, or maybe a thousand. I can't remember what the claim is. But it's a kind of a collection of what was around at that time, put together by a figure who uh, became to be known as Picatrix. So you also wrote that the book has a diabolical reputation, but despite that, its influence on the European and occult traditions cannot be understated. But I'm curious, why do you say it has a diabolical reputation? Oh, because it has, you know, ingredients like human heads, penises, um, blood, (laughs) dead cats, um, you know, uh, mostly on the basis of its ingredients. uh, I'm saying that it's not like necromancy or anything like that in the sense of raising the dead, but a lot of pretty foul ingredients are used in it. So I would say that alone would be enough to kind of give it a bit of a dark reputation. Yeah, and the Picatrix talks a lot about what's called suffumigation magic and suffumigation for people who don't know means to fumigate from below and this is similar to something like i guess burning incense right yeah that's right and often in an enclosed space you know even the key of solomon has a whole thing where you put a carpet over your head and inhale the fumes you know from a sensor right to to capture them all so yeah fumigation is a big part of a big magical technique for sure yeah, yeah. And uh, Dan Attrell, who's a, a friend of the show here and whose work you cited throughout oh, the book, Dan wrote that rituals performed with suffumigations and prayers are more effective than those in which suffumigations are lacking or the will is divided. And obviously Dan isn't here uh, yet to explain this, but what does that statement mean exactly? Oh, I think that, you know, if you burn, say, uh, some rose petals <laughs> and you perform some magic, I don't know that you're going to have the same sort of effect if you burn some cannabis resin in that same ritual or the same perceived effect, at least. You really see the influence of the Picatrix in the magical and alchemical circles during the Renaissance, especially on guys like Paracelsus and Agrippa, but also on guys like yeah. Dee and uh, Giordano Bruno. But in relation to those first two guys, uh, Paracelsus and Agrippa, they wrote extensively about magical and medicinal herbs. How exactly did the Picatrix influence their work? Well, there's like, you know, stuff on astrology, uh, you know, astrological stuff that Agrippa worked into uh, his books. Both Agrippa and Paracelsus were students of Trithemius, who had was very familiar with the Picatrix before it became banned literature. So, yeah, they, they, people know about it. You know, it's not something I discovered that, 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 that they were influenced by it, but there's stuff right out of the Picatrix in some of Agrippa's work. So that kind of goes with it. And the fact that they were both students of Trithemius is also pretty good, strong evidence of that. Uh, Paracelsus as well was supposed, supposedly used some imagery out of the Picatrix in some of his stuff. And I, you know, he, he was also, according to his servant, Oprinus, using opium for summoning demons and stuff like that and claimed to be able to summon demons with his laudanum. So, uh, you know, that's kind of right long blinds of the Picatrix as well. You know, another area of the Picatrix's influence that you wrote about was alchemy. And alchemy is not something that I have traditionally associated, I guess, drugs or psychoactive substances with. But there is some evidence that people that were doing, you know, traditional ritual alchemy were probably also getting high as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I I would think so. Uh, You know, like the whole goal of alchemy is the marriage of the sun and the moon. You know, and in my view, the sun is, you know, present aware consciousness and the moon is representative of our subconscious or unconscious, you know, and that this is a uh, spiritual process of merging our, you know, our, our unconscious with our conscious mind, achieving a more creative individual. And, you know, I think that uh, this is indicated in the works of Rabelais who was called himself master of the quintessence. And I think, uh, you know, he has the herb Pantagruelian, which is cannabis, uh, coded into both three chapters where he hid hid cannabis in it. And my view on Rabelais' work is is that this is all to do with cannabis use for that purpose, you know, for for a marriage of the sun and moon or the marriage of the goddess with the individual, your anima mundi, which is your counterpart of your soul, your night soul, you know. You mentioned Rabelais. We'll talk about him in a a bit because I have a lot of notes on him. But I want to throw this out there that I found out in your book that uh, cannabis is also known as the Saturnian herb. And you wrote that uh, that alchemists like magicians were deeply influenced by the Kabbalah and hermetic arts. And this included astrology. So every conceivable plant, animal, metal and mineral was given the dominion of the planets above. And cannabis, in this case, appears with other psychoactive plants and a number of alchemically influenced herbal and magical texts under the dominion 
dominion of Saturn. And then you have a quote here too from Dr. William Sharp. Dr. Sharp said that my child shall know that the stone called the Philosopher's Stone comes out of Saturn. And uh, Sharp also talks about how this can protect man's body from an illness. And then, you know, back to what you said, from an alchemical perspective, Saturn is of great importance as it is the border between personal and cosmic powers. The Black Crow is the symbolic messenger of Saturn, symbolizing the black phase of alchemical transformation, sometimes referred to as the dark night of the soul. Well, you know, the, the, the reference is the idea that cannabis is associated with Saturn. That occurs in a number of uh, Renaissance-era herbals, uh, such as uh, William uh, Lilies, I think, is, is what it's called. And, uh, oh, I forget the name of the other one there. Um, but I've got them listed, you know, a number of, I, I think I cite three or four herbals that uh, have cannabis placed under Saturn. So it's pretty clear that that's the case on Saturn. And the idea about Saturn playing that role in alchemy, this is, again, not something I'd come up with. This is like the standard uh, of view on this, and as well as the whole astrological thing. These are just, that's just the way it is. You know what I mean? It's not like something right. that I'm suggesting, anything like that. Now, definitely, I see the association there. You know what I mean? That's the planet of Saturn. That's the type of things that they were using in that transition phase. And those references are all pretty clear, you know, that cannabis is a plant of Saturn. Cannabis appears in elixirs and quintessences that are used in that type of a way, you know, that, that type of uh, spiritual uh, growth that involves that whole symbolism uh, of Saturn being the kind of death and rebirth spot, you know. So that's all there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And in relation to this, uh, you quoted a book by Christian Ratch called uh, Marijuana Medicine, and he cites Agrippa regarding this whole Saturn connection in a quote that's reminiscent of the classical, you know, black obsidian stone style of the magic mirror that would be used later by John Dee. He says, of the operation of Saturn, when this planet would ascend, the agents would depict on a so-called magnet stone, an image of a man with the face of a stag and the feet of a camel who sat on a stool or dragon and who held a sickle in the right hand and an arrow in the left. Also, both the Picatrix and Agrippa cite three different Saturnine spirits carrying a, a sickle, which is interesting as that is the sickle or the uh, Scythe, I guess, right? That takes its name from the Scythians, perhaps, and was the traditional tool for harvesting cannabis. So the name Saturn is said to come from the Latin meaning to sow or to plant. So you say that, that Ratch is just speculating here about Agrippa's comments on the relation of Saturn and cannabis, which is fine, but I am more intrigued by the mention of magic mirrors in cannabis. You wrote on this that the uh, combination of magic mirrors and cannabis also appeared in at least two popular Renaissance-era grimoires, and this traditional pairing can be followed in literature well into the early 20th century. So the grimoire connection, is that also come from the Picatrix? No, uh, they're from 16th century grimoires. One of them is called Sefer Raziel, Liber Salomonis. Now, there's a number of Sefer Raziel out there. This is Sefer Raziel, Liber Salomonis. And the other uh, grimoire is the Book of Magic and Invocations. And it has recently been republished as the Book of Oberon. Oberon is the, uh, the king of the fairies, and there's an invocation of, to Oberon in, in the uh, Book of Magic and Invocations. So the new publication just took that name. Just people were more familiar with Oberon nowadays. So in, in these recipes, in, uh, in the uh, Sephiraziel Liber Salomonis, the recipe is for cannabis and wormwood to be used in an ointment for seeing spirits and demons in a mirror. And in the Book of Magic and Invocation, it cannabis and devil's trumpet, which could be any number of plants. And some of those could possibly be very potent nightshades as well. So these are grimoires that are written at the time of Dr. John Dee, when he himself was uh, mirror scrying with his scribe, Kelly. So this is evidence that, uh, you know, he, there's, it, it seems pretty clear he would have had access to these particular grimoires. You know what I mean? He's like had access to more magical documents than anybody that he wouldn't know about these English grimoires, but like contemporary to him uh, seems quite unlikely. And, and uh, um, I uh, thinking this, I went through these actions, which are his communications with spirits through the mirrors uh, that he did with Kelly, and I looked for a long time, and I found a number of passages that were indicative uh, that he did, in fact, use uh, psychoactive substances. You know, let me read you a couple of those. One of them is, uh, Taste of this potion, yea, the savor only of the vessel worketh most extremely against the main drowsiness of England. If the hand be heavy, how weight and ponderous shall the whole world be? What will ye? So this is clearly a reference to drinking some sort of potion, 
and kind of going into a drowsy, dreamy state. And it's important to remember that he had a, a direct linkage to Paracelsus through Kunrath, the, the Rosicrucian figure, who was a student of Paracelsus. So there's a direct link there. And then in another account, there's a lament about the lack of drugs for an operation and the use of ointments in their place. And this is a situation where uh, John Kelly, uh, I mean, Edward Kelly, the scryer, is talking to a figure in the mirror, and uh, John D is uh, writing it down, right? And uh, this is uh, how it starts out. I have forgotten all my drugs behind me, but since I know that some of you are well stored with sufficient ointment, I do intend to visit you only with their help. You see, all my boxes are empty. And he showeth a great bundle of empty apothecary boxes. This brings a response from the figure invoked. How cometh that you pretend to come for a favorable divine power and all your boxes are empty? Now, uh, <laughs> so, you know, basically <laughs> what I see happening in that, you know, Kelly was a bit of a con man to begin with. Not to say that uh, all of these uh, and Kelly's actions are a, a crock of poop. They're not. You know what I mean? There's some very interesting stuff in there. But he was a bit of a con man at the same time. That's often the case, I think, you know, you find with magicians, shamans, people like that. They're often a mixed bag of tricks. And uh, they may have been, you know, like a situation where Kelly was trying to manipulate B into producing some more drugs so the visions would come on. You know, oh, the angel yeah. can't talk to me because the apothecary box is empty, you know. And <laughs> uh, um, that situation fits in well with Zephyr Raziel and the Book of Magic and Invocation, where ointments were used for that very purpose. Yeah, and you know, both Dee and Kelly have been connected with this uh, mysterious Voynich manuscript, which has an image uh, which is strikingly similar to earlier depictions of cannabis in it, and the vellum on the manuscript is composed on it has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, so it seems like it's been maybe a bit before their time, but do you think they had any connection to that document? I don't know. There's been like talk about similarity in writing and stuff like that. And that Kelly may have used it to scam somebody or something, but you know, it's all kind of speculation. I mentioned it out of interest because I wanted to uh, bring in that plant that others have compared to a cannabis plant in, in the Voynich. And there's actually been a new uh, uh, attempt at a translation. And uh, there's a, been a paragraph translated in relation to that plant image, and it does uh, the, the new translation does indicate that it's cannabis, but it's a condemnation of not anything positive. Yeah, so, you know, when we got cut off, I wanted to um, circle back to something real quick. You know, on the story of Jesus, you do write about it while you're discussing the Knights Templar in a section of Chapter 6 called the Crucifixion, question mark. Yep. And crucifixion is hyphenated between crucia and fiction, and fiction is spelled F-I-C-T-I-O-N, which made me chuckle uncontrollably for some reason. But I want to set the scene here and then ask you about it. You know, there's a man named Jesus. He's nailed to a cross, says he's thirsty, and is uh, supposedly given a spot sponge soaked in vinegar to drink and i i've also heard he was dabbed with a sponge so i'm not sure which is accurate but what happens like is vinegar a, a code for like maybe a, a cannabis infused wine or some other cannabis substance yeah. well vinegar was like sour wine back then right see he's given like some sort of a, a preparation via the sponge on the cross and some sort of infusion is, is the idea and that, and it, that again is not my idea the first person that I know of that wrote about that explicitly was Professor Hugh, Hugh Schoenfield in the Passover plot, but many people have written about it uh, since then. So, yeah, that's the idea, is that he was given um, some sort of preparation while on the cross, and that this preparation faked death, and he was revived a few days later. So what was up with Jesus then? Was he having a, a psychedelic trip? Was he having a near-death experience? Uh, both, perhaps? I mean, what, what actually did he experience, yeah, you think? Did a both. Did a both, yeah. You know, he would have had the same sort of visionary experience that earlier people that took such infusions had, as recorded in the Zoroastrian references that we discussed earlier. And there's Gnostic accounts like that as well. You know, there's the uh, Gnostic text uh, Zostrianos, described a guy taking a beverage, having some powerful experience, and in that he says, and I did not take it again. And uh, there's the Gnostic teacher uh, Marcus, who was uh, written about uh, in the condemnation of the Gnostics by the church father Irenaeus, I believe it was. And he's initiating people with a cannabis-infused wine that he called the blood of grace. You know, it's important to remember that Jesus used the same sort of symbolism for his Eucharistic wine, mm -hmm. uh, blood, this is my blood, you know. 
So uh, the account in Marcus, the numbers of people, I thought I was the first to write about it when I wrote my book, uh, Sex, Drugs, Violence in the Bible in 2001. But when I was researching this book here in the mid-19th century, uh, I forget the name of the author, but I, I discuss it in, uh, in Labor 420. There were, was a guy writing about it in a book on uh, kind of a scientific look at magic. And he's talking about the same passages I was talking about and suggesting the same thing I suggested about a, a drug-infused wine. And I found a number of authors that have suggested the same thing. And uh, Tom Hatsby's as well has a, a new book coming out that discusses these same passages. And just to tie up that point there, you had mentioned in the book that Robert Anton Wilson referred to tests sponsored by the U.S. Army in the 1950s where THC put dogs into hibernation or deep sleep for eight days. And then when they were woke back up, they showed no ill effects whatsoever. So, you know, I don't think Wilson had any evidence to support that claim, but it's an interesting claim uh, nonetheless because it, yeah. it would indicate that, you know, if Jesus was dabbed or, or had consumed some, some sort of cannabis-infused wine, then he would be out for a while. And it may have been more than just cannabis. You know, I discussed, you know, uh, Avicenna wrote about the, you know, combinations of mandrake, cannabis, opium, things like this, used for these same purposes, right? You know? So it could well have been, you know, any variety of plants. Cannabis is an interesting one, particularly because uh, in the 19th century, a group of biblical scholars suggested that the mirrored wine given to Christ on the cross was a preparation of cannabis. And we know from uh, ancient references that, uh, you know, Jewish references, that the one on the way to crucifixion was given uh, incense and wine, you know, is what it says. And uh, there's also complaints that some of the priests were taking the same wine that was used to ease the pain of the crucified victim to the house of God. So obviously it had some sort of antiogenic uh, preparation as well. And these are old, you know, ancient references. So... You know, it's pretty clear that these types of infusions were around. There was some awareness of them. Yeah, yeah. So, Chris, my favorite part of this book was this section about who you said was possibly the most intriguing medieval and Renaissance figure involved with the history of cannabis. You name-dropped him earlier, the 16th century monk, alchemist, and bachelor of medicine, Francois Rabelais. And I'm going to read what you wrote about him here. You wrote that Rabelais is best known for his hilarious epic adventure Gargantua and Pantagruel, a bold and bawdy satirical tale of two giants named Gargantua and his son Pantagruel. The book is equal parts philosophy, sex and fart jokes, and slapstick humor, along with outright heresy and a generous dash of arcane knowledge. And uh, as one biographer of Rabelais noted, his large book is a giant jest uttered by a giant intellect. You also said that he mocked much of what the church deemed holy, and because of that, he earned the, the nickname, The One Who Gives the Pope the Finger. So, Chris, I gotta say, man, Rabelais and his story here, which is a series of five novels, actually, sounds a lot like my jam. I haven't read it, but I actually just ordered the Cohen translation of it after reading your book. Cool which seems to be one of the better uh, translations of it. So I'm looking forward to it showing up on my doorstep. But anyway, Rabelais and his story do relate to our overall discussion here of cannabis. Please tell us what that connection is. Well, Rabelais incorporated cannabis in his grail-like parody about uh, Pantagruel. And in the story of Pantagruel, Pantagruel's buddy, Panurge, is worried that he's going to be made a cuckold if he marries. And so he, uh, um, they go, decide to go on a, a voyage to find the holy bottle, which is an oracle, and it'll tell him if he's going to be made a cuckold uh, if he marries. And it's kind of funny because the whole grail myth, you know, in the Arthurian thing, it's when Lancelot and Guinevere get it on that uh, the king loses his pocho, right? You know, he's made a cuckold. <laughs> um, and so I think Rabelais was playing on that uh, symbolism. And in the voyage, find the holy bottle, they load the ship with the herb Pantagruelian, uh, and it says the raw and confected, raw, not only the raw sort, but the confected, so preferred into confection, foods and stuff like that. And then in Rabelais' fifth book, I believe, he has three chapters devoted to the herb Pantagruelian, and he gives a botanical description of the plant as well as its uses, and it's clearly cannabis, but it's written in a way that you have to know about cannabis to be able to identify it. And he takes from the works of earlier people like Pliny and their descriptions of cannabis and works it in there. So, you know, not everybody was reading that type of stuff at the time. So it just went over the head of a lot of, a lot of the people that would have looked at it. 
so it's, when it was discovered that this was, were references to cannabis, these books were banned. Particular passages were banned, the chapters on, uh, on Pantagruelian. And even into the 20th century, some of the published versions of Gargantua and Pantagruel omitted these chapters on cannabis. So, yeah, that's, you know, it's pretty clearly in there. And also in Pantagruel, Rabelais talks in the first person often, and he refers to himself as the extractor of the quintessence, which is, again, these arcanas of quintessences, which were these preparations of cannabis and other substances infused into wines and alcoholic preparations. And he talked about to a friend about this preparation and prepared an excellent quintessence, like a holy grail, he called it. So he's connecting the quintessences with a holy grail as well. So I'm suggesting that these hidden chapters to cannabis are some indication of what he was using in his quintessences. And in his prologues to the various books, he says specifically that there are certain things uh, hidden in these books. And he compares his books to a Seleni box, which contains rare drugs. And he also uh, refers to them in uh, comparison to an opiate cordial, which would be a can, you know, an opium-infused preparation to drink. So it's pretty clear that he's you know, given the reader a lot, lot to work with in way of symbolism here in regards to you know, using the language of the birds, also known as cant. But uh, it's pretty clear that Rabelais, with the same sort of metaphorical language used by the Sufis, was directing the reader towards uh, these secrets about cannabis. You know, I don't know if many of the listeners would have heard of Rabelais or this, this series of books here, but we mention it because, as you say in your book, it had a tremendous uh, philosophical influence on later occultist and cannabis experimenters, particularly Aleister Crowley, the Hellfire Club, members of Le Club des Hashishins, which I'm not sure what that actually is, if that's uh, an extension of the original Persian group. And then you also mentioned that it had a uh, an influence over the last of the great alchemists or the last of the great plagiarizers maybe, uh, Falconelli. Falconelli put a lot of homage to Rabelais. And you mentioned Crowley there, you know, like you can't, there's no way to downplay the influence there because Crowley's word, you know, the word of the aeon, Philema, was taken directly from uh, Rabelais' Abbey of Philema in the Book of Gargantua, along with the Law of Philema, Do As Thou Wilt. It's taken directly from Rabelais' Law of Philema, you know, the Law of the, the Abbey of Philema, you know. And uh, interesting thing that people can check out, a lot of people probably have the Book of Thought, and if you go to page one, two, three of the Book of Thoth, you will see a line that says, I cry aloud my word as it was given unto me by thine uncle, Alcul Fribius Nassier, the oracle of the bottle of that book. And that word is trink. And uh, then it goes on to an essay, the Herba Sanctissima Arabica. That means the most holy grass of the Arab. And this is a whole essay written by Crowley using the same sort of like a metaphorical language, language of the birds and symbolism and stuff like that in relation to cannabis and his own ingestion of it and the mythology of cannabis. And so he's directly linking cannabis with Rabelais right there. And in a poem released in the same year of the Book of Thought, where this uh, reference I just occurred, although he wrote it earlier, he released a uh, poem, Trink. And he refers specifically, uh, and Trink is the holy word of the holy bottle. And he refers specifically to, you know, drinking hashish and uh, using cocaine and stuff like that in relation to this Trink and uh, the lion limbed, which might be a, a, a reference to Pantagruelian and Panta being five and lion, right? Five limbs on that. Um, but yeah, if you can check that out yourself, page one, two, three of the Book of Thoth or page 177 of uh, Crowley's Liber Alif has this same essay. And, you know, what's really kind of interesting to me for that essay is uh, when I first read it in, in the early 90s, uh, when I read it in Libra Alif, I had this really crazy synchronistic experience with the number 77 when I read it, triple seven. And uh, uh, right when I was buying it and stuff like that, that number came up and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I opened the book. And inside, it's written from the, the great and wild beast with magical sun, 777. And, and that says in the book, oh, this was written for a certain individual. Uh, and they talk about, you know, some success you probably have. They don't mention it by name. Later, I would learn that this individual was Charles Sansfeld Jones. And then later still, I would learn that he lived in Vancouver, where I lived. Then later still, North Vancouver, which was a particular part of North Vancouver I lived in. And then later still, Deep Cove, which is the tiny state square mile area of Vancouver where I grew up in. And then a couple of years ago, 
when I decided to dig around a bit further, I found out this guy lived just down the street from me on the street I grew up in, in Deep Cove. And then he did uh, hash with Crowley in that 1918 thing that I discussed at the beginning of the interview. So kind of interesting that Crowley wrote this hashish essay for a guy that lived like just doors down the street from where I grew up here in Vancouver. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, man. And on, you know, Crowley borrowing Do What Thou Wilt from Rabelais, uh, as well as the Thelema name, didn't Rabelais take at least the Do What Thou Wilt from St. Augustine before that? Yeah, well, Brown before Crowley particularly acknowledges Rabelais for his own use of it. Thelema is like the, the Greek word for will, right? So it appears in a number of variations. Augustine's is a little bit different than, it, you know, than, than Crowley and Rabelais. I think it's has a couple of different words in there. So it's a variation of it, but likely inspiring to Rabelais and then going through Rabelais into Crowley. Yeah, and back to Rabelais' book, it's a Renaissance classic. It's known as this profound cosmological and metaphysical work, but it's also known to contain, or at least it's speculated that it contains uh, some sort of hidden alchemical symbolism or some sort of hidden meaning in general. What do you make of that? You know, he talks about the marriage of the goddess in there and that by the herb Pantagruelian, we might find a way to marry our goddesses and be a threat to the gods. And he's got all this stuff hidden about cannabis in there. I also, you know, there's stuff about the Templars and other things uh, incorporated into Pantagruel. His heroes drink like the Templars do. The, te- the Templars were, were no one is drunks. So he's obviously indicating something else when he's using that language. There's all sorts of stuff incorporated in there, man, all sorts of science. And yeah, I I don't know where to begin on that. You know, there's a great book, the Rabelais Encyclopedia goes over a lot of stuff and a lot of the symbolism uh, that people have figured out. Yeah, and it's important to note, too, that Rabelais himself was sort of, uh, he sort of like ridiculed alchemists who were doing like lead to gold stuff, but he was really fond of the uh, spagyrical alchemists, you know, who work with plants. Yeah, yeah, he, he thought the whole lead to gold thing was a farce, and uh, he ridiculed a lot of figures, you know, people say there's references to Agrippa in there as her Agrippa, and as a kind of a jokey kind of uh, alchemist, you know, the, the worst of it all. And uh, other other figures as well, other historical figures have been incorporated and mocked in, in, in the story as well. You also mentioned near the end of the book one of my favorite characters from occulted history, Cagliostro. Was he getting high too? Well, you know, um, Elipus Levi indicated that Cagliostro was burning cannabis and fumigations, uh, as I discussed in Libra 420. And in a journal of debate written in the 1920s, there's an account uh, about uh, discussion about Cagliostro's, and there's a, uh, they discuss a witness, too, that w- went through uh, Cagliostro's initiation that worked as a druggist and said that he recognized the effects of hashish. You know, and then in the Masonic Magician, uh, a book about Cagliostro, they say that Cagliostro was in possession of one of these herbals uh, that listed cannabis under the planet Saturn, and he had an elixir of Saturn. And when you read some of uh, the accounts of Cagliostro's various initiations, what's known about them, it does indeed seem like some sort of, you know, definitely elixirs being taken in these Masonic, quasi-Masonic initiations, the Egyptian rites, which he claimed came from the Templars originally. And, all you know, there may have been other plants in use as well. P.D. Newman has released his book, Alchemically Stoned, uh, which suggests that uh, there was an extract of acacia, uh, acacia can uh, produce DMT, Uh, in use by uh, Cagliostro and other Masonic uh, alchemical figures. So you mentioned this pan-like trickster, Robin Goodfellow. I was curious if you could just tell us a little bit about him and his association with cannabis, because he might also be known in pop culture under a different name, right? Yeah, that's right. Robin Goodfellow is Puck in uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And there's numbers of, uh, he's kind of a trickster fellow, you know, go kind of like looks like pan goat footed horn you know uh, he was also considered the god of the witches and um numbers of the folk tales about him uh refer to him helping you know women uh break the hemp or do other things with hemp and uh also trying to get hemp for the people hemp bacon or flax give me hemp bacon or flax he said his catchphrase was hemp and hempen so uh you know he had this really strong association with hemp and Shakespeare worked him into A Midsummer Night's Dream as Puck. And Puck's also referred to as Robin Goodfellow in the script. 
And in Shakespeare uses the line, uh, what hemp and homespuns have we here? Coming from the mouth of pot, kind of in reference to his association with hemp. You know, it's interesting to note that in, in the uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Oberon, the king of the fairies, uh, also places an ointment on the people's eyes to make, you know, cast a spell on them, make them fall in love, that type of thing, which is indicative of magical properties. And we have the grimoire with an invocation for the invocation of Oberon that contains the recipe for uh, cannabis and ointments and things like that, as well as other drug recipes. Uh, poppies, uh, various nightshades, that type of stuff. So it's interesting that Shakespeare worked this in to uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, one of the chapters I have, as you know, in uh, Lieber 420 is about Shakespeare and the work of two South African professors, Professor Francis Thackeray and uh, Nicholas Vandermeer. Uh, their theory that Shakespeare was a secret cannabis user. And they actually had pipes recovered from the property where Shakespeare lived tested for, for cannabis and found evidence of cannabis in them, you know what I mean? Uh, um, it's not clear whether these were Shakespeare's very own pipes, but they were pipes recovered from the area after they already had their theory about his uh, use of cannabis based, based in various passages of uh, Shakespeare. Now, they weren't including these ones from the, A Midsummer Night's Dream. They were looking at other passages. So pretty interesting, really. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you, you know, I have read Shakespeare high. I was wondering if, he, if you thought he was writing high, but apparently, you know, maybe he was. Yeah, that's definitely the uh, theory of uh, Professor Francis Thackeray, Thackeray and uh, Nicholas Vandermeer. And I uh, let, you know, I let their information speak to itself for a lot, but there's a lot to it. And it's very interesting stuff. Yeah. So, you know, back to Robin Goodfellow for a moment. Was he also maybe the basis for the Robin Hood character? Yeah, actually, yeah, there's a real uh, connection there, Robin Goodfell and Robin Hood, uh, definitely. The idea is, is that Robin Hood also had, like, his 12 merry men, which is, you know, with thir- makes 13 with himself, members of witches in a coven. Uh, there's other connections as well. One of the other things that I really liked in here was you mentioned necromancy and phantasmagoria, not something that I think you would traditionally associate cannabis with, but how does that play a role in both of those practices? Well, the phantasmagoria ceremonies were often necromantic. You claim to be raising the dead and ghosts and stuff like that. And this goes back to the uh, German uh, Masonic figure, Johann Schroffer, who would initiate people uh, with this uh, magical punch and then uh, perform these rituals. And in these rituals, it was uh, reputed that unknowns to the people attending them he was using which, what is known as a magic lantern, which is kind of like a primitive slide projector. And by playing this into plumes of smoke and things like that, it would appear like there was a deity to these people at this time in the 18th century in the smoke itself. And, uh, you know, they would use slides with moving parts so you could make the eyes roll in the head or the mouth open, that type of thing. And people really thought that they were seeing ghosts, you know, through the effect of both the drugs and the various effects using smoke and mirrors. A lot of times, the the, the, the land would be pointed into a mirror, which would redirect it over to another area of the place, that type of thing, you know, and, and some smoke there, you know, and create this whole illusion and effect. And I post images of the type of machinery that they were using and accounts from people that attended the ceremony and then also accounts from uh, uh, people that later discovered how this was all taking place. Some have accused Cagliostro of using some of these same techniques. And there's another figure, uh, Carl von Eckhart Chausen, who also wrote about uh, various nightshades and other narcotics used in uh, suffumigation and magic and practiced that and accounts of his ceremonies. And he uh, uh, published quite explicit diagrams of this sort of uh, technology. It's also interesting to note that John Dee first got into trouble when he was in school uh, for stage effects that he had uh, produced mm-hmm. for a school play. And people were so mesmerized by the effects that he produced on the stage, he was accused of witchcraft. Uh, and he had to show them how it was all just a uh, series of pulleys and mirrors and that sort of thing uh, in order to be not charged for, for, for that crime. Chris, dude, uh, we're near the end of our time here. Let's tell the people where they can find your book, Libra 420, and, and where they can keep up with you uh, personally if they'd like to. You can find my book on Amazon, other things. If you search Lever 420, it'll pop up pretty quick. And you can, I have a blog over at CannabisCulture.com. If you search my name there, you'll find some of my articles. 
and follow me on Facebook. I'm always posting stuff about this sort of, sort of thing and uh, uh, interested in talking about it with like-minded individuals. Definitely, man. Well, I really do appreciate your time here. I look forward to maybe speaking to you again soon sometime if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely, man. Take care. And there you have it. My thanks again to Chris Bennett for calling into the show and sprinkling a bit of his magical herb into our rolling paper. And it really was just a sprinkle. Like I said up front, Chris's book is 800 pages long. A lot of it is stuff I already knew personally, so I did kind of struggle with what to discuss here. So I, I guess I just went with the highlights up front as a reminder and then threw out some of my personal favorite things there at the end. I really did enjoy the part of the book talking about Francois Rabelais and his Gargantua and Pantagruel novels. I told Chris off air we could have talked for an hour just about that, and I'd really like to. So maybe there's a Rabelais deep dive episode in our future. What else is in our future? Well, it is 420, so hopefully some of that sticky icky as they used to say on the streets of South Central. But before you go getting all stoned ape, please do check out the Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash occulture. A couple new patrons in the last couple days. My thanks to Paige and Chris for joining the cause. And you can join them if you like and help support the show starting at just two bucks a month. I'm going to start doing more Patreon extensions as I mentioned in the last episode with Jason Louv. And not just more extensions, but longer extensions as well. And the more ear holes we get on Patreon, the longer the guests will stay to chat. It's hard to convince people to stick around for extensions when you dip from thousands of listeners to about a hundred. So actually, maybe you should go enjoy your 420 and then get on the Patreon. I'd really appreciate that. But anyway, it's Friday. I got a shitty full-time job. I got a bunch of shit to do. But fuck it. I'm going to enjoy the day the only way you really can. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.